Moving forward. So I'm going to talk about my book, Aluminium Dreams, Lightness, Speed and Modernity. Uh, it's a project that began when I saw some beautiful advertising from the Alcoa Shipping Company. And they were running cruises in the Caribbean in the 1940s and 1950s. And it seemed funny to me that I knew Alcoa was a company that makes aluminium, and I knew that there was bauxite mining in the Caribbean. But I got interested in the fact that a company that mines bauxite was also running a cruise ship. And I started to think about the mobilities that connected uh, the, the United States and the North America to the tropics and how the representations of the tropics might be connected to the mining industry and the bauxite industry. So it set me off on a sort of study of the cultural history of aluminium as a way to think about 20th century mobilities. So the images are of countries like Jamaica and Trinidad um, and Suriname and they show the islands as these places that are frozen in time. They're very traditional, and each one has a face and butterflies, birds, plants, and they're almost like a collection uh, of these special tropical wonders. And they seem to be outside of time. They're very kind of slow and backwards. And to me, that seemed such a contrast with the image of um, aluminium, which is associated with modern technologies and transportation systems and speed. And it turns out that the cruise ship itself that they had uh, built was made with all the newest uh, al aluminum technologies and attempts to show off uh, how fast these ships could go and how luxurious they could be using this new metal. So I started looking into the history of aluminum and I learned not only that it was uh, first discovered simultaneously, it turns out, by a Frenchman and an American. And they were both the same age. They were 21 years old, uh, a, one in, named Charles Hall in America and one named Pierre Heroux here in France. And they discovered this way of smelting aluminum in 1886. And that began the beginnings of this industry that drove uh, a whole transformation of material culture because it got incorporated into all sorts of vehicles of um, trains and cars and eventually airplanes. Um, so I wanted to start thinking about why aluminum had influenced speed and mobility in the 20th century. And when I looked into it, one thing I found was that it was a very important military uh, material. So the beginnings of air power and air-based warfare depended on the production of aluminum. And that's why the countries that knew how to make it, they started to try to create the, the resource base to have bauxite mines because it would be the way they could wage war. And it not only goes into airplanes, but it's also used for bombs. And I didn't know this when I began the project, but that uh, Bombs like hand grenades, uh, a, an explosive called thermite, um, and today, more recently, all sorts of things like nuclear bombs and uh, any kind of explosive uses powdered aluminum. So all the great military powers at the time in the early 20th century realized this, and they started to build, begin to build these industries so that they could have the greatest uh, weaponry. Uh, so that brought uh, the Alcoa Corporation into the Caribbean, where they mined bauxite mainly in Jamaica and Suriname, um, and later Haiti as well. Um, so this metal was a metal of warfare, and also governments and states supported the industry. So the industry grew up uh, in association with warfare. Um, and it also created then this uh, inequality between the countries where the mines were located, the bauxite mines to make aluminum, and the countries that were gaining power uh, through producing aluminum. So 
So I started to trace these, um, using these advertising images as a way to think about this history. And in contrast to the Caribbean imagery, I found another set of ads uh, from the 1940s as well that were about these dreams of future technology. And because there had been a huge buildup in production facilities during World War I and especially World War II, they realized that after the war, they would need to convert all of the factories to make civilian goods. And that's when they started to employ designers and inventors and um, industrial uh, sort of dreamers to do what they call imagineering, which was to think about what would the future be like if we used aluminum, not for warfare, but for civilian purposes. And so they dreamed up all of these new um, transportation technologies. And I have a series of ads from a corporation called the Bone Corporation in Detroit. And they created images of future rocket-propelled airplanes and giant uh, sh cruise ships that they called Dreamliners. Um, and images of uh, trains with special glass observation cars and all aluminum uh, bodies of the train. And they, they wrote in these ads about how the future would be transformed by this metal. And it was called the speed metal. Um, and it would become this sort of way of envisioning a new future of urbanism and of fast transportation. So all of this came out of the war um, and was in strong contrast to the tropical countries where the bauxite was being mined. Um, and today we still, I think, live in the sort of um, the background of that future, that imaginary of the future, which was an imagination of speed and lightness. And we still have vehicles that are influenced by that um, aerodynamic, streamlined style, which comes from this period. I have some examples of uh, these vehicles, like an, an early kind of minivan that was called the Stout Scarab, designed by William Stout. And he had a motto. His motto was, simplicate and add lightness. And so he took vehicle design and he just sort of streamlined it and made it as light as possible. And uh, Buckminster Fuller, another designer, created a car called the Dymaxion car. And it was a three-wheeled car, and um, it was sort of a teardrop shape, and it could uh, move very quickly. And originally, he planned for it to fly and drive. It would be uh, a sort of ambidextrous car. Um, and then there were vehicles like the Airstream trailer, which became this kind of icon of American uh, dwelling on the road, dwelling in motion um, in these kind of silvery aluminum type objects. And that influences today's car designs where we still have um, the, the sort of re reinvention of the, the car w using more and more aluminum parts. So the Audi A8, for example, or the new Jaguar F-Series, um, some cars by Cadillac, um, they all have increasing amounts of aluminum in them to make them lighter and they've created new alloys that are very strong and light um, and that are supposed to help us uh, become more fuel efficient, right? They're supposed to help our transportation systems reduce uh, their weight and therefore save uh, fuel. And of course, things like bullet trains, the Japanese bullet trains in particular, are known for this kind of single um, uh, piece of aluminum that they're made from. But the important part that I learned in researching this, this history was that aluminum production is one of the most energy intensive processes of all metal kind of refining on Earth. It uses about 13,500 kilowatt hours of electricity per ton of aluminum. And to put that in perspective, if you took uh, like a six pack of cans of soda or beer, it takes one quarter can full of oil to make that six pack. Would only need 5% as much energy to recycle it, right? If we just melted it down and reused it, it only takes 5% as much energy. And yet we throw away billions of cans every year. In the United States, we throw away about 55 to 60 billion cans each year. They end up in a landfill, despite the amount of electricity and power that it took to make them. And in producing that electricity and in the smelting process itself, aluminum production makes a lot of carbon dioxide and also hydrofluorocarbons and other um, very uh, strong greenhouse gases that contribute to climate change. 
Um, but most people don't know that. They don't think about that um, when they use aluminum. And we, we're very wasteful with it um, because it seems light and it seems easy. It moves easily. So I started to think in this project about not just how it contributed to vehicles, but also it transformed many household objects and um, things like uh, cans. Of course, we all think of the aluminum can, but other things within the house. So various kinds of appliances and furniture were made more movable, more light, and it kind of contributed to this modern style of things and streamlined style. Um, there's also some interesting work on um, coffee pots, like the, the Bialetti, um, the classic little aluminum espresso pot that says that there's a connection between caffeine and aluminum, because caffeine kind of speeds up our brain. It wakes us up. It makes us um, more lively. And it's very similar in a way to aluminum, which kind of lightens things and makes things more um, fast. And so they kind of go together, caffeine and aluminum. Um, there's a writer named Jeffrey Schnapp who's written about that. So it transformed our vehicles, it transformed our infrastructure of transportation, and it transformed things within the home. It also transformed architecture. So one of the um, first buildings to use a lot of aluminum was the Empire State Building in New York. When we think of skyscrapers, people usually think of steel and glass as the material of skyscrapers. But what made them kind of light and luminous was the aluminum because it enabled us to make curtain walls with uh, windows set into aluminum frames. On the Empire State Building, if you see it gleaming in the light, you see a kind of shine on the surface of it, that's aluminum. And when they used that for the first time, it enabled them to build very quickly. And it was a way of introducing speed into architecture because the materials were lighter. As the floors rose up, they could build the Empire State Building in only 14 weeks, which for that time was very, very quick. And it then went on to be used in many other skyscrapers um, and architectural landmarks, including the World Trade Towers in New York. And if you think about those metal, that's all an aluminum curtain wall that, that sort of surrounded those buildings. And when they were struck by the airplanes on September 11th, 2001, they were struck by aluminum airplanes. And the explosion of the fuel in those, in those was probably also contributed to by aluminum exploding, um, which contributed to their falling down. Um, so for me, that those sort of bookmark, the Empire State Building and the World Trade Towers falling are the sort of bookends of the age of aluminum. And we're now kind of moving beyond the age of aluminum because we, we have uh, new light materials like carbon fiber and titanium and other things that are competing with it. Um, but Aluminium was crucial to, as I said, vehicles, to changing the home, to changing architecture, and also to um, the age of air travel and flight and the space age. When you think about all of our airplanes, they're made of aluminium. All of our rockets are made of aluminium. All of our satellites, the Earth is kind of circled by a halo of aluminium. And rocket fuel itself is explosive um, aluminum within it that makes it, that's what makes the rockets go up in the air and fly. Um, so beginning with the, the Russian Sputnik satellites in 1957, those were the first um, things to orbit the Earth. And then right up until the space shuttles, um, which have just been retired recently, those have about, I think, 90% of their uh, weight of the space shuttle is made from aluminum. So there was this kind of age of air travel and space flight that this light metal brought to us. That's what I see as the kind of bright side um, and the gleam of aluminum and all the things that enabled us to do. Um, but it also has the dark side. And the dark side is not only the amount of power it takes to create it, but also the mining industry and the way that mining destroys uh, many tropical countries. And people don't really know that much about it because we don't think about where this metal comes from. It's just sort of there, um, and we use it, and we throw it away. Even when we're flying on an airplane, we throw out our cans, not even thinking that we wouldn't be there up in the air if it weren't for this uh, metal. 
And the environmental impacts are especially in countries like um, Jamaica um, and Suriname, were the biggest bauxite producers in the early parts of the 20th century. And then mining switched to countries like Guinea and Australia, um, and to some extent, India and China. And in each place, it's open pit mining, and they've taken down whole forests and left behind this substance that's called red mud. And the red mud is a very caustic and toxic substance, and it's just kept in these big pools and just sits there um, and it can cause all sorts of environmental damage. Um, so there's the, the direct pollution of the mining and then there's the air pollution caused by the smelting process itself. So around the world there's protest movements against aluminium um, and I attended one in the summer of 2007 in Iceland called the Saving Iceland Movement because Alcoa, this American Aluminum Corporation of America, was uh, building a big smelter in Iceland. And they um, built a, a dam, which was the largest dam in Europe, on one of the great wilderness areas of um, Iceland. And people there sort of mobilized against it, but they weren't able to stop it. The project went ahead. Um, but they had this um, series of what they called summers of protest, where activists from around the world came. Um, and there were people from Trinidad, from Brazil, from India, from South Africa, who were all telling the story about mining and smelting industry in their countries and how they were trying to fight it. Um, and they also argued that aluminum has health effects on the body. And in fact, there was um, a, a fairly recently a, a TV program in, shown in France on, um, on uh, France 5, I guess it's called, uh, and it was a story about the health effects of aluminum and how it's in many of our foods, it's in our vaccines, it's in makeup, it's in antiperspirants, um, and some people believe that it has uh, neurological effects on the brain when we get too much accumulated in our bodies. So part of the movement against the metal is also about its health effects. Um, so these are all things that I researched for this book, and, um, and I wrote it um, on uh, an Apple MacBook, um, which is, of course, made from aluminum. And we, some of us have heard about the um, problems in the factories in China where they're making Apple products, and there have been uh, workers have been killed through explosions. Those are explosions due to the aluminum dust, which accumulates in the air when they polish the, the MacBook products. Um, and again, it's a side of the industry, part of the dark side that we don't really think about. Um, and ultimately, I hope in writing this book that it will challenge us to really look at where our things come from, what are they made from, and all of the things we depend on to be mobile, and even our mobile communication systems, our computers and our iPhones and our um, satellite communications, they all depend on this metal and yet we have no idea, most of us, um, how it got here and what effects it's having. And we really need to think in the future whether we can continue to use it in the way we are or whether we need to be much more careful with our use of it and recycle and um, think about reducing the amount of aluminum that we use. <laughs>